There we go. There we go. We'll turn it over to you, dude. Okay, and I'll look for Rick here in a second. Thanks. I'm leaving. Have a good one. Thanks for all your work on this stuff. It's been great. Absolutely, man. Uh -huh. There you go. Okay, Rick Seeger. And we'll see who comes on. I asked Ron how many had signed up, and I got Ron's normal answer. I don't know. <laughs> well, I expect he doesn't know. <laughs> yeah. This is uh, 11 o'clock your time. It's noon here, so I don't know how many are out of Knoxville and the Northeast Tennessee. That would be Eastern time. Uh, I like when we when we work the RV resorts. I really like uh, cr working in Crossville because we watch the Knoxville TV stations. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Speaking yeah. of Knoxville TV stations, uh, let me introduce you to Chris Baker, who ran one for like a gazillion years. Oh, Channel Eight WVLT. Hey, Chris, you're unmute. Uh, I have to unmute him. 
Oh, okay. Sorry. Hey, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. You're on three, two, one. Oh. Q. How are you, Ed? Doing fine, sir. Doing fine. I'm just uh, getting this hosting down. Yeah, I was at WJHL with Jack Dempsey. Yeah, I, that's what I was saying. I bet you were with Jack. I was Jack's first GSM from '89 to '99. Then I went to WWL down in New Orleans, and uh, my kids, it just didn't seem to be a good place. So I came back and took over VP of Marketing Communications for Mountain States. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I did that for 13 years. Uh, Jack went on to WCYB until he retired. Right. Yeah. I stayed in touch with Jack. He and I used to play golf a little bit. And uh, he was, I always said he had the funniest stories. He would have me laughing until I had tears coming out of my eyes with his, yeah. his stories. It's at Dempsey, you know, his uh, great uncle was the Jack Dempsey. Yeah. Uh, and he had his temper. I'll tell you that. <laughs> well, I've heard that. I never saw it, but I've heard it. <laughs> Younger days, he had more of it. Uh, and then I was, yeah. ma I mean, he used to um, get on the PA and go, Herbert, call 4534. Herbert, call 45. That was his extension. Well, I knew that tone. I thought, I'm not going to call you. I'm coming down to see you. <laughs> I'd, down, I'd, shut, I'd shut his door and he'd say, what are you doing? I said, well, if you're going to yell, you might as well yell at me in person. <laughs> <laughs> he, he got, we got through it um, very well, very well. Gentlemen, That's I don't great... know how many we're going to have. Um, how do you want, I will introduce Rick to go through his program. I'll introduce both of you and have Rick go through his program. Uh, then we can go from there into, uh, yeah, I'll ask them to raise hands, chat, and we'll see what questions we have. The, my main goal here, when I joined the board last year, I'm not the clinical guy, but they have a real brand awareness in one Tennessee that I'm helping them overcome and metrics, but it's not just them. I noticed many of these organizations yeah. and how do you measure it? Well, what's the success? What do you, yes, end opioid abuse, but how do you go baby steps to get big steps to get there? Process improvement. And I haven't, so I haven't really been able to help that. But when we got this conference pulled together, I think there's a lot of good things happening but I really think that there are people with some money, people with no money, people with a lot of money. We can get them all together instead of wasting airtime with A, B, C, D, E, F messages. Right. We can do a series under the same banner. I think we can do a lot of good. Well, I do too. And of course, Rick's got a great presentation and, and uh, I'm going to be here to just kind of support him. But there's there's nothing like it. And you know, from your days in television uh, here and I can tell you from my days in Knoxville, uh, when when we when we got the pep spots for from TAB, we ran them, you know. Yeah. And, and it, it, Rick will show maps and coverage maps and things like that. But my gosh, I mean, we're getting the return we're getting from people. Uh, you know, we we tell them we'll match them two for one, but it ends up being a whole lot more than that uh, usually. And uh, the values there, and it's just I don't know, it's just it's such a great opportunity and we, that's why we really limit who we take and our membership is just all about opioids and, and, and wanting to do something. I've had actually don't get many requests for, have you considered this as a pep campaign, but this is one that I get. So, um, well, unfortunately Tennessee can say we're number one and that's yeah. not a good thing to be number one in. When I was in the healthcare, we had docs, we had to have arrested. We knew they were running pain clinics and just illegally. Uh, I think that with electronic health records has been halted. I, I really do. I think, I think the problem is we're now to the point where it's not so much providers as much as it is illicit, illegal. Um, and as long as there's a market, there will be people looking for it. Uh, I, I will tell you that I use, I'm one thing, Jack, when I first came back and went to the, the health system, he said, now you should come back to me. I said, no, nah. I use television for a lot of these. Uh, messages in radio. Uh, I didn't do billboard. I didn't like outdoor. Um, never have because of, I can't measure. But I'll tell you what, it changed Mountain States. It, it changed it. Sure. Um, I know in 2012, we won a Clio and I didn't even know we won it. And so when they brought it to us, they said, can we use this commercial in other markets? And so we franchised the commercial. And uh, I've always known, my dad was in CBS News with Mr. Cronkite. He ran WKRC up in Cincinnati. Wow. He, He's been, he was before his passing, which is why I got it. Chris, he was, I always saw what television could do. Mm -hmm. uh, as an actor, I did commercials, I did production, I did, 
And then I got into sales management and stuff like you did. And I, I just saw that there's so much power, which is why today, this is the television of today. Yeah. Uh, video, yeah. audio. Well, gentlemen, we should be seeing people signing in and we'll see because uh, my understanding is they sign in in one to two minutes. So let's give them a little bit of time. Okay. But I, I will introduce Rick. I'll introduce you, Rick, we're going to your presentation. And then we'll see what people say. Okay. Uh, I don't know how many have signed up. Uh, I'm not sure. If you got a lot of clinical people, they may not be as interested in this. The person I really need is executive directors and the communications directors who are trying to get their message out. Right, right. Okay. And I hope we have a few. <laughs> so, Rick, you are ready to be a star. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's, it's old hat for him. I will tell you that after um, doing a couple of virtual conferences as a participant, they always run behind. Every session yeah. started way behind. Well, we're going to be early. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I believe that when I see it. <laughs> no, no, not starting, finishing. Oh, yeah, finishing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think starting is going to be tough. But um, well, yeah, more in, in, in any adult who does this often, has to feel for a child. My grandchildren are in school, Zoom and um, virtual and real, but it's, I feel for them because uh, we've been, we did our whole national conference for the RV industry. I'm doing now, Chris, I, I do marketing for RV industry, okay. uh, resorts and things. And mm -hmm. we've had to do Zoom with Lazy Days, with RVR, with a number of them. And they're terrible at it. <laughs> I mean, they're just terrible at it. Uh, You'd be surprised at how many broadcasters are not good at it, especially the small market radio guys. This is just not something that they're really into right now, you know. So uh, they're, they're well, I've always known. Up, oh, hi Megan. I see Megan in here. I'm going to unmute her for a second. Megan, would you unmute and so we can say hi? Hello. Hey Megan. Glad you joined us. We'll be starting shortly. Can you give us a quick who are you and where are you with? Um, my name is Megan Ravis, and I'm with the Hamilton County Health Department. Near Chattanooga. Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, Megan, we'll be starting here. We're going to let some people join on, and we'll get right back to you. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. You know, when I've done these in the past, you know, you, 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 know, you have a lot of chatter, like, you know, we're just talking here and, and Megan's now going to be subjected to it, I think. Well, if you were in a real conference, the same thing would be going on in a conference room. So it's okay. Yeah. I had to start a, okay. And I'm going to have to add, I've got another one. Vindya Karkala. I just joined us. Nice picture though. Very nice picture. Yep, oh, she left. <laughs> there you go. You mispronounced her name. I don't, I'm not sure. I think that was pretty close. Let me see. Yours is Rick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's rearranging. Now, I was doing a um, national conf a national event in Kingsport. And I, I had the high school band come roaring in with all of our dignitaries, the president of Kiwanis and everything else. And um, it was in 1998, I will tell you, I was in Johnson City about two months ago and some guy came up to me and said, I remember when you, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's 22, three years ago. He said, yeah, but when that band came in, that was cool because I pretended like nobody was showing up. Where's the, the whole head table is empty. I said, we need the president. And where's the, where are the dignitaries? And I had a busboy come running down the hall, hand me a note. I said, oh, I forgot. Hit a bell and say, welcome to 1998 Kiwanis convention. And then all of a sudden the doors bust open and the Dobbins Bennett band did their thing, man. They wow. roared in. It was wonderful. <laughs> so are we getting a marching band? This yes, morning? they'll be in here in just a minute. Um, <laughs> I love marching bands. Played in the Macy's Day Parade, escorted Santa Claus in 1971, 40 years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw you in that. Yeah, that was me and the star. I was in the star of the Christmas tree. <laughs> band from uh, Germantown, Wisconsin. We had 900 kids in school. 250 of us were in the band. 
you also played basketball, football. You did everything in that school. Yeah. And uh, we were invited to Macy's to escort Santa Claus. I'll tell you what, that was fun. 14 mm-hmm. years old. But I just moved from New York City to Wisconsin. So I knew my city. I had a ball. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, we father, uh, follow, well, we didn't really follow them, but um, we hung with Father Ryan Band, who my kids were in uh, for years. When they did Macy's, we just happened to be up there for Thanksgiving. I've got a son and his family up there. Man, wasn't that fun, but what a zoo. Oh, it is. Listen, if you're in the band, you got to be there about uh, in uniform, set 6 a.m. in West in Central Park. Uh, at that time, it was about a four mile parade, and uh, it was 17 degrees the day we did it. So we all got plastic mouthpieces and it was cold, but it was it was memory. I, I can still remember Lauren Green was our host of the Macy's Day Parade. He came down and thanked us afterwards. And you know, most of the kids were like, hey, isn't that Paul Cartwright? <laughs> so, well, actually, his name is Lauren Green. Well, I want to go with that. I'll tell you what, it's five after. And I was asked to start this at five after, so we won't take anyone's time. What I will do is uh, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce. What we're doing here today is talking about a media campaign media campaign that we can, as organizations, bring together. And as other people join, uh, we can catch them up. This is being recorded. Um, they all are being, yes, I see it's being recorded. So it'll be available for people to come back. Now, to present this to us today is Rick Wimbley. He's a public education program for the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters. I, myself, am from the broadcast industry of about, uh, well, 15 years in the industry, and then another 15 years using the industry. But uh, the public education programs, it's an outreach initiative. And Rick came to One Tennessee and offered a program. And we thought, you know, we should bring this to many more and see if we could come together. And when we came together, we could do more with less clutter. There are a number of organizations putting out PSAs and messages. We're all going after funding. And we thought, wait a minute, what if we could do using this, this very uh, summit as an opportunity to bring more people together and more efficiently use the limited funds. We could do better messaging and we could get greater reach with what Rick is about to produce. Now with Rick today is the president and CEO of the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters, Chris Baker, and they'll be talking to us here about an opportunity again. Now Chris also comes from broadcasting, spent 19 years as executive vice president GM at one of my favorite stations in Knoxville. VLT Channel 8. So I'm going to turn this over to Chris. He has a presentation for us, some videos to watch, and then maybe we can have some quick chat as to next steps. So Rick Wimberly, it's all you. Okay, let's um, get my screen share done correctly. We can see that. Just need it full screen. We'll be good. We'll be good. Okay, you can see the uh, screen, mm-hmm. reaching large and diverse Tennessee. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great, super. I like it when a plan comes together. Well, first of all, Ed, thank you. Um, Chris and I are real pleased to be here and to uh, talk about your important work. I mean, opioids have have touched my life and, and I guess, well, they've really touched everyone's life, so. Uh, I will say you've got your work cut out for you with uh, some major challenges on your hands, looking at your goals and uh, on your website. I see engage and collaborate, inform and educate, measure and improve. Uh, those are, are some ambitious goals, particularly when you're attempting to cover such a wide area as you are uh, the state of Tennessee. Uh, not only a wide area, but, but a diverse area. So uh, that's what we want to talk about today. And, and hopefully this will be an interactive session. Uh, the presentation itself uh, will be relatively short, uh, but hopefully we can brainstorm some ideas of things such as what would the message be? Um, where can we get funding? That's going to be a good one and hopefully there are people um, who are, are watching or who are participating who will um, uh, perhaps have some ideas on that. So uh, it, kind of the way we look at it is we feel like there is potential for us to help you 
uh, reach our large and diverse state uh, with a carefully crafted single unified effort, which I know is what One Tennessee is all about. Um, and Tennessee, as you know, can be a real tough state for messaging uh, when you consider that we've got three regions, we've got 42,000 square miles, 27,000 acres. Chris, did you know we had that many acres? Million, I think you meant to say. <laughs> yeah, 27 million. <laughs> 27 oh, million. Sorry, 27, yeah. <laughs> and we've got 6,900 people. Uh, actually, maybe that's 6,900. There you go. <laughs> and um, did something funky just happen to my screen or is it? No, it just shrunk. Yes. Okay. All right. That, that may happen again. So what, what our program is, is, is what we call the public education program. And it's a production basically of the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters. And the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters is a, is a powerful and uh, uh, rather large organization when you consider that 95% of the TV stations in the state are members of the TAB and 85% of the radio stations in the state are members of the TAB. And thus, as members, they participate in the uh, public education program. In a few minutes, when we talk about the reach of the program, I'm going to show you some coverage maps and some other information that just shows you how special this program is for, for reaching this large and diverse state, particularly when it's joined with some of the other outreach initiatives. So what exactly is PEP? PEP is kind of the a combination between public service announcements, which everyone's familiar with, and paid commercials, which everyone hears and sees on, on radio and TV, but it's kind of a blend. Um, interestingly enough, the Federal Communications Commission approved this program some years ago that allows the broadcast associations, and ours isn't the only one, but others around this, uh, country to, to make discounted advertising or discounted priced advertising, significantly discounted, available only to nonprofits and government organizations, only to nonprofits and government organizations, and, and only for particular types of messages. Uh, for example, uh, you can't lobby for a piece of legislation but you certainly can produce general commercials uh, that would be heard by legislators across the state. So it's kind of a combination. The stations um, do participate uh, by obligation to the TAB, as opposed to a pro public service announcement where the uh, participation is 100% voluntary. Uh, when you produce a public service announcement uh, and deliver it to a radio or TV station, um, honestly, the chances of it getting used are not particularly good because there are so many other demands for their PSA time. But with the PEP program, uh, they commit to us, the association, that they will air the commercials and that they will tell us exactly when the commercials air and what the value of the airtime is so that we can uh, report back to, to our partners uh, to let them see you know, what they've gotten in return for the investment. And we make a commitment that that value to it, that, that investment to value is three times value to, 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 to $1 spent. The reality is that because of the way that, um, that we uh, run the program, uh, those ratios are usually significantly higher than, than they would be uh, as if you were to, to secure this airtime on your own. And uh, Ed, I see uh, Katie Wright has joined us. So welcome, Katie. Uh, we, uh, we, this presentation I'm doing is going to be relatively short. So, if there's some catch up that you need to do in a few minutes, then uh, we'll be able to catch you up. So that, that basically 
is is what the um, uh, PEP program is, the use of broadcast radio and TV. And of course, our communications preferences have changed over the years, but the reality is that local radio and TV are still superpower forces. People continue to rely on radio and TV for so many things. And certainly COVID has been uh, a real good example of that. Uh, during COVID, a study that was conducted showed that 83% of people said that they would trust what they see on local broadcast news, 83% in a nation that um, is divided to say the least. And there always is, you know, lambasting of, of the media but 83% of the people who were surveyed here said that they trust uh, local television uh, over all other media. The other thing is that uh, on the radio side, um, uh, another survey that was conducted showed that 88% believe that the true value to local radio is its local feel, whether that be in the music they play, uh, the, the personalities that they use, uh, whether that be the commercials you hear, the news, um, the emergency coverage that, that local radio stations are so good at, that that helps provide uh, a connection between the audiences and the spots that air. In fact, yesterday, I had the honor of, of, of judging the finals of a uh, radio broadcast course at Middle Tennessee State University. And at the end of each critique of maybe 15 or 16 commercials they did, radio and TV, one of the things that we talked about was whether the commercial really related to the audience. And actually I was quite impressed with what these students did and how well uh, they related in various forms. It could have been in the music, it could have been in the copy, could have been in the slug lines, it could have been a variety of things, but, but no one relates better to, to, to local folks than, than local radio. The other thing is that despite what you may think because of Spotify and Pandora and et cetera, et cetera, YouTube, that people still consider radio to be the king of the road for music. And we're not talking about, you know, producing music here for One Tennessee, but obviously one uh, music is one of the major draws that, that uh, in addition to relatability, that gets people to, to local radio stations. And this perhaps uh, is, is one of the most important pieces of this puzzle and it's the magnificent reach, which is a term that advertisers use to, to really describe um, how many people are touched by programming or touched by, by advertising. And what, what the PEP program does, since it includes most of the TV stations and most of the radio stations in the state, what it provides is phenomenal reach to people regardless of what they do. And I know in, in talking to, to Ed and Lisa and some of the others at One Tennessee, one of the objectives of the organization is to be able to reach practitioners across the state and to, to get your messaging there. And that can be challenging. They are in a lot of different places and doing a lot of different things. And, and you folks know better than I do uh, what a challenge it is to, to get messaging to practitioners. And with PEP, although the messaging is not necessarily 100% directed to practitioners, you can be assured that practitioners as they're going from one place to the other doing this and that and living their, their, their full and, and busy lives, that they are spending time uh, hearing radio commercials and hearing and seeing uh, TV commercials. And because of the magnificent reach that we deliver and the variety of the types of audiences, uh, and I know opioids, you know, may have, you know, uh, 
peaks in, in certain demographics. Certainly, you know, from what I know of it, it's, it's, it, it crosses all demographics, all sociographics uh, as well. And that's kind of what we, we deliver. Here, here is, you know, don't expect you to absorb this, but this is more to illustrate. Uh, this is uh, simply a list of, of the member stations uh, of the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters who, who will air the pep spots. But this one is almost even more dramatic. And this is what we call a coverage map. And what you see there in this big blur uh, would be the coverage of the broadcast signals of the radio and TV stations uh, that are members of TAB. And you can see not only do, do we have magnificent coverage in Tennessee, broadcast signals are based on physics and you can't stop a broadcast signal uh, at, at the uh, state line. So, and Ed knows this better than most because he worked in a market for many years that, um, that covered um, uh, multiple states uh, mm -hmm. within their coverage map. So this looks like a big blur, but uh, it is a, a computerized representation of, of um, our coverage map. Uh, this is kind of a blur too, but basically it's a demographic profile for selected coverage area. In this case, the coverage area is the member stations of the Tennessee Association of Broadcasting broadcasters and this organization ISP goes and looks at the coverage area, goes to census data, does this and that and the other and um, produces a profile of, of, um, of demographics. And you can see that, um, that uh, it's spread all over the place. Uh, there is a good spread of male, good spread of female, good spread of of different uh, uh, ages, uh, whether they be, you know, very young people or you know older people like me, and uh, so uh, we we basically blanket the state. So it's a pretty interesting offering. So the obvious question is, who in Tennessee uses PEP, uh, the public education program? This is not a complete list, but this is a list of some of the people who have used it over the last few years. And, you know, without a doubt, you'll recognize various associations, various government agencies and nonprofits like Youth Villages, which is a, a, a nonprofit that has, uh, that works with young people. In fact, chances are good you have seen on the TV stations that you watch and on the radio you, that you listen to, you've heard commercials for this. and these all of these things and, and 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 you know didn't realize that this was part of an initiative that that uh, where these people are provided with the phenomenal reach of this program at, at, at deeply discounted cost so i wanted to play for you for just a moment if i may an example of some of the recent tv spots of course i didn't put a lot of right well i didn't put any radio in here but uh, this is uh, a kind of a compilation. It's not long. It's two or three minutes long of some of the TV spots. And, and, and we, we picked ones that we thought that would have not the same message, but would have kind of the same uh, vibe as something that, that um, one Tennessee may want to do. Uh, you'll see in these messages, there's a lot of heart. There's a lot of emotion. And there's a lot of uh, facts. And um, so uh, if you could just watch this and uh, see what you think of this. You cheered for us. You sent us messages of support. Some were big and some were small. Dionos, thank you for taking care of the sick people. Now the best way to support your community health care workers is to get your COVID-19 vaccine. That one the gets flu can me. be deadly, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be. The flu shot is a safe, proven way to lower the chances you'll get sick or give the flu to someone at risk. And it's not too late to get one. 
The flu shot is covered under most health plans at no cost to you and available at doctor's offices, pharmacies, and most local health departments while supplies last. To help protect yourself and your loved ones, get a flu shot as soon as you can. If I, I could pause for just a moment and just give you a little bit of background on that. Uh, this is a campaign that was financed by the Blue Cross uh, Blue Shield Foundation. Uh, and it was a real aggressive campaign. You would be hard pressed not to have uh, seen the spots or heard, or heard radio in Tennessee. And obviously, as you know, you know uh, quite well that um, the flu uh, vaccinations uh, uh, worked, uh, not to mention masks and other things. So we didn't have a lot of flu. So then we pivoted the uh, campaign for Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, to a COVID uh, spot. The first one was financed by the Tennessee Hospital Association, which I think is, is, is one of your members. And, and those spots, when that little girl, who I suspect is a, is a voice actor, but when she talks and reads that thing, it just gets to me every time. And I've seen that spot a hundred times. The Department of Commerce and Insurance regulates insurance in Tennessee. That means more than you might think. We're experts on insurance, so we can explain your options and answer your questions. You can turn to us for help when you need it. We protect Tennessee consumers every day, and we want to help you. For more information, visit tn.gov commerce. COVID has only changed one thing, everything. In times of uncertainty, it's important to know your rights do not change. Stay informed on policy changes, health care, special education, and affordable medications. Text TOGETHER to 615-808-8683. We are in this together. Brought to you by the Tennessee Disability Coalition. You'll note at the end of each of these commercials is what we in the business call a tag. And right. And, and that's basically where we say uh, on TV, we can show it on the screen, on the radio, obviously we have to say it, you know, brought to you by One Tennessee, this station in cooperation with the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters. Sometimes we have to say that real fast as you're about to hear, uh, but that would be at the end of every spot that, that helps give some identity to who paid for it. Really it's, you know, you have to kind of required to do that. And it helps give the uh, the stations uh, credit for airing these spots, not only with us, but as part of their uh, commitment to the FCC that they will do public service advertising. Rick, if I could jump in, it doesn't have to be um, one Tennessee folks. What it would be is probably a landing page, a place to send them to for more information. One Tennessee is a collaborative arm. And we're looking to bring some of the attendees from the summit to see if we can make something even better for all of us using PEP with TAB. So don't worry about the tags. We, we, again, the production tags are something we can really do something fun with. Go ahead, Rick. I'm sorry. Yeah, and, and yeah, I think that's a good point because um, if you don't do this on a daily basis, you look at these commercials and you think big film production. Uh, they're really not. Really, the most important part of the commercial, uh, in, in my opinion, is really the message. And that yes. is the thing that you will talk about more than anything else, because you do have a tricky message here. And uh, but, um, you know, we can work with you. Ed certainly has this type of expertise to come up with that message that you feel like would resonate. Um, and then the the drama of presenting that message is something that uh, that that we can do. In fact, a lot of these spots are are pulled um, uh, with a um, with visuals of, of things that they already have in the house, but they are memorable because of the copy and because of Great the way they're presented. Your childhood bedroom, the sheets, the wallpaper, being safe and warm. A child in foster care might have a different bed every few months. Imagine how that feels. Without a family who cares, it never feels like home. These children deserve more than just another bedroom. Youth Villages needs foster parents who can make a temporary home feel just as wonderful as the real thing. Find out how you can help a child find a way home.
Brought to you by Tennessee Youth Villages, this station, and the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters. I think that spot is brilliant for one thing, um, in addition to the message. But when that little foot spins around, I mean, that just, you know, gets to you and you say, okay, I understand now what Youth Villages is. Contact your local fire department and ask if they provide free smoke alarms. This is one, um, and the, what you're about to see now are just short clips. Uh, this is one that the uh, Department of Commerce and Insurance aired. And um, it happened uh, not too long after uh, those really horrible fires in Memphis. And so when there's something like that that goes on, although all of our stations participate in the PEP program, we do what we call earned media help which is we will talk to uh, Chris actually, you know, he knows all these people. So he calls his, his peers, the bosses of these TV and radio stations. And he says, we're about to run a campaign for, for fire alarms that commerce and insurance is paying for. And you know what's been going on in your market. Could you, you know, maybe throw in something extra in addition to your commitment to us through PEP and invariably um, uh, they do it. And uh, as soon as we finish this, which won't take but another second, um, I, you know, um, Chris is gonna talk about how the potential for working with you folks has struck a nerve with, with, our, with our board of directors, who are the people who, who are not only running these radio and TV stations, but are real active in, in their communities. To learn scam fighting tips or to file a complaint, visit us online at tn.gov slash consumer. The Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance wants to ensure Tennessee businesses are resilient despite recent economic disruptions. For more information, visit sba.gov. Talk to your lender or realtor or visit greatchoicetn.com. Brought to you by THDA in cooperation with the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters and this station. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> I told you we had to zip through them pretty quickly sometimes. Okay. So now, then, okay. Before we go to, if I may, before we go to uh, Chris, Katie, uh, we know Megan is with the Hamilton County. Uh, who are you with? I am at Methodist Medical Center in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. With the hey, Knoxville Department. Market. Yeah. yeah. Chris is from WVLT. He was the general manager there for years. Okay. Well, we'll be right. We're going to be talking about this briefly in just a moment. Chris, take it away. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Rick. Um, you know, our board of directors and really our members see our PEP program as a partnership. And we truly do, uh, we are selective about who we partner with. Um, we know that our inventory is precious and we know that our commitment to public service is, it, it, it's real and the stations really wanna get behind these programs. And when we mentioned opioids and we've talked in the past about a friend of mine it happens to be the director of the, the TBI. So we've also had that conversation with David Roush. Some of you from Knoxville may remember David when he was uh, chief of police there. Um, and uh, we've had the same conversation with him. This is, it, it, we, we understand, our stations understand, and they see every day and they report news stories, unfortunately, every day on the abuse, uh, on drug abuse and, and the abuse of opioids. And so, We've actually had, and this doesn't happen very often, but we've actually had requests. We've had people say, you know, I'd really love to get behind something. Could PEP maybe, uh, you know, do something about this problem? Is, are there, is there an opportunity to do a partnership out there? And so uh, when Rick talks about um, earned media, what I do is I, if it's something that we know that is near and dear to them, we also know that they're gonna wanna know if there are opportunities to do stories or promotions or get behind fundraisers or things that might be happening in their markets. And so if we can find out about those, we can also help drive that earned media piece uh, from this office. We can't guarantee it because it's pretty unethical to guarantee somebody that they can, that they can get uh, news coverage. Right. News, 
you know, especially in, in we like to say in lo as local broadcasters, you know, we're, we're dedicated to the news being real and the news being the news, not something that someone paid for. But on something like this, there's no, absolutely no doubt that the stations would love to get behind it. So I see that as a real plus and, a, and a, an opportunity to, to just add on to the, um, the good that we can do. Well, folks, here's where we get to talk now. <laughs> when we heard about this, uh, the marketing committee of One Tennessee, and again, One Tennessee is a collaborative organization, nonprofit. Uh, we've been doing training with clinical. We've been doing training with nurses and doctors. We've been doing ER projects with Vanderbilt. We work with other organizations. And when we put this sum together, the media campaign that Rick brought to us, um, I'm kind of a bridge between the two worlds. I was spent many years in television marketing. My father grew up in television, or I grew up in television with my father. Uh, Chris, he was CBS all the time. <laughs> he was CBS. He was CBS in New York. He covered the Kennedy assassination. If you ever watched the Kennedy assassination, folks, that's my dad's voice you hear in many of the chamber breakfasts. Oh. Um, he was the man hosting it in a way. So I grew up through television from the infancy all the way to today. I believe in it. Uh, I also know the power of it. Well, I was also in healthcare for 13 years trying to communicate. That is, uh, I traveled the state of Tennessee in 2003 and four at Mount States because we wanted to help make all hospitals tobacco free. It's funny to think that just 20 years ago, people were still smoking in hospitals, around hospitals. That's gone now. And a lot of it was television campaigns. We really did use TV a lot in each market. We'd go there, talk with it, get the extra, as he was saying, the earn. Uh, that news is powerful because it has credibility. Um, what we're trying to do today now, Katie and Megan, is if you're looking at doing something in your market, we're trying to see if we can bring more organizations together to, to create a message or messages about the opioid epidemic, things that we can do, things the public can do, because we understand TV is a very general broadcast and it's in the term broad it's not slim casting and we can go after people of all all lifestyles we can tell them what to look for we can tell them what to do we can tell them who to contact we can do different messaging but i agree with rick earlier the messaging is probably the trickiest thing when it comes to funding and when it comes to production i bet we can get that done but messaging so i'm gonna ask if uh, i'm gonna start with megan you joined us today. What was your hope that you could find out? And is this something that you might be interested in with Hamilton County? You'd have to unmute, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, I'm, I work in overdose prevention. And so we, uh, we're specifically focused on preventing overdoses, um, primarily opioids, but really any substances. Um, and one of our one of our activities um, for this year is creating, really focusing on a social media campaign um, in Hamilton County for uh, overdose prevention. Going to focus, you know, on some of our higher risk populations. Um, so I'm just joining, just to, just to learn. Um, uh, yeah. Well, imagine if you could get on RCB or DEF, TCI, TVC in Chattanooga, and there was a message that we were sharing together as organizations, uh, sending them to a hotline, send them to a helpline. Uh, that might be something that could be of interest. Um, I, I know Joe Legee used to, he just retired from DEF, but, you know, uh, and DEF was a station I worked with closely in uh, park broadcasting. So Chattanooga and Chattanooga cross across, of course, into Georgia, just like we did into Southwest Virginia. Um, your social media, this could be something that we send to a landing page that would help you grow your message. May I ask one thing though, in your prevention, what is your main message? Um, so we're really, really from now until about December is kind of figuring that out. Um, we okay. have a lot of focus groups. Um, uh, stakeholder input, et cetera, just to learn more about some uh, some gaps that may be present in Hamilton County specifically, messaging gaps, um, to really kind of hone in on what our messaging is going to be. 
It's the toughest part, Megan. It really is because we found at One Tennessee when I joined them last year on the board, um, it's easy to talk to providers. But the key here is that between electronic health records, the hospitals, providers, and the pharmacies, it's pretty tough. I mean, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get a fraudulent script anymore. We as patients don't see the scripts. They go straight to the doctors in Tennessee. So a lot of this is more illicit on the street, you know, illegal substances. Um, but that, that's good to know. That's good to know because you're in the same boat as many. Don't, don't feel bad. Many of us are still wondering what's the best message because folks, we have to admit, until we stop the customer, there's always going to be a seller. And if we can help the customers dwindle or decrease, the sales will go down to where it won't become an issue anymore and we can stop the, the issue. Uh, Katie, could I ask you if you could uh, let us know, you joined us today, what were some of your hopes in the call and what are you looking for? Yeah, sure. Uh, I Honestly, I wanted to see if there was um, a program already in development and what that might look like uh, to the public. Um, I'm certainly interested in, you know, just what information is out there um, to try to help promote the safety around opioids and citizens of Tennessee. So I, honestly, I, I joined in thinking there may already be a program in development that you all were gonna share with everyone, um, but I'm certainly interested in kind of all the discussion that you all have had. I think it, it's such a um, important topic right now uh, and anything that can be done to you know, just promote public awareness, particularly in that younger age group that we've seen um, more overdose, uh, unintentional overdoses, you know, that 20 to 35 year old um, age range. And again, your business, are you with a hospital system? I am, yes, I'm a, a pharmacist and um, I work uh, again at Methodist in Oak Ridge. And do you see in your county a great deal of overdose in your ER? Uh, we, we have our share of overdoses in our ER, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, we are working, like I said, what we hope from this summit is to take some of the points that we've heard from others and bring them to a messaging and then try to bring that through the PEP. And I see, um, you know, the PEP program is being the most cost effective that we could use limited funding. Um, so I appreciate you letting us know that. And thank you for being a pharmacist, by the way. It's a very, I mean, there's a lot out there. We have a lot up in East Tennessee at the Quillen College of Pharmacy. Uh, I've done a lot of work with them too. Uh, Megan, did you have anything else you wanted to add at this point? Um, I don't think so. Well, what I've got, we have, we've recorded this folks. And for Rick and Chris, what I'm going to try and do is go back and we're going to take some of uh, this offering and broadcast it, you could say, to all the attendees and let them know that this media opportunity is available. We need as an organizations to come up with the right messaging and we can find the funding. I know that. Because when you get a strong message, the funds are there. Right now, there's a lot of us looking for a few dollars, a lot of us looking just to get our message out. And maybe what Megan was saying about that message, what Katie said about the age, the demographic, this could be something we could use um, as a foundation for messaging. Rick or Chris, did you have anything else you wanted to throw in there? Rick? No, I don't know that I had anything to add other than certainly being available to answer questions. But I do have a question, and, and I think for, for Katie and, and Megan, is I, I am curious about, uh, and I, <coughs> pardon me, Megan, I know you're going through uh, that process in Hamilton County, but I am curious about what some of the bullet points are that, that, that you feel like would be effective messaging if you're going after, you know, this, the, the state of Tennessee. Well, I guess what you're looking for is, well, what are you, what are some of the bullet points you're, you've considered to date, maybe? It, it, yeah, Megan's off mute. She's ready to talk. Yeah, she's there. Yeah, so we, we're considering um, a lot of different, uh, different messages and obviously, we're more focused on overdose prevention. So I think that that um, kind of changes it. If you know, if you were gonna focus on substance use 
disorder prevention, like you, your messaging would be different. Um, but we're, we're looking a lot at stigma reduction, um, uh, especially surrounding treatment and MAT. Um, around Noxalone, anything around Noxalone? Yeah, we want to uh, provide at least some education on harm reduction strategies and um, the resources that are, are available in our community because we do have a lot of re good resources available. Um, but really just, you know, highlighting the resources that are there. Um, we have already had some um, work groups and uh, received some input and stigma is definitely a big topic that seems to keep reemerging. Um, and just, just stigma around substance use disorder as a whole, um, but also around different harm reduction strategies that uh, hinder people from taking those next steps uh, to be able to um, initiate use. So really that's, that's kind of what we're pursuing right now. Uh, but like I said, we, we, we're planning on having focus groups um, and et cetera to kind of narrow down what, we, what we're really gonna target. But I wanna make sure I heard you right. Opioid prevention or just prevention, the stigma of that, and then also some like Noxalona, because I know the state, the new um, commissioner of health came from Michigan. She did a huge Noxalone program. And that was one of the three that we were looking at, a Noxalone, something about public prevention and the stigma. That could be three separate messages that could be created over time. So I want to get that into the recording, Megan. To make sure, uh, do I have that right? Is those are those three areas you were mentioning? Yeah, and um, naloxone and just other um, harm reduction strategies, such okay. as you know, not using alone, using a clean needle, um, because really you have to meet people where they're at. Um, you know, you you can preach treatment all day long, but if they're not ready uh, to take that step, then that's just that's not going to have any impact on them. Um, so you really have to meet somebody where they're, where they're at. And that might be telling them, hey, a best practice is not to use alone to make sure you have naloxone on hand um, and, you know, go from there. Okay. And yeah. Katie, I, I, if I took Katie's uh, message right, Katie, I think you were talking uh, more about the prevention was also in your in your viewpoint, you were looking at, was there something, a program going out there that included prevention? Is that what you were pushing on? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, in my practice setting, uh, the focus is really about appropriate opioid prescribing habits. I think we've, we've made a lot of uh, change in the last several years in Tennessee with mm -hmm. uh, some laws that have been imposed, as well as the use of the CSMD that I think has helped with that. But there's still opportunities there. So I think anything that can be done to improve prescribing practices, um, and then educating the public about safe use of opioids. There's, they certainly do play a role in some therapies, um, but making sure people understand the appropriate use of those and uh, safety around those. One so, of the things, you go ahead. I, I know there's been a, a little more of a focus on the illicit drugs that are available now that are causing more harm and um, but there's still, you know, a number of prescription drugs that are out there uh, or ones that look like prescription drugs that might get into um, someone's hands that could cause harm as well. So just educating the public about the safe use of opioids. Yep. Okay. You know, one of the things that I was talking to Rick about and with Lisa, I wish there was an opportunity to create a fast as we have for stroke for opioid. Because when you talk about stroke and someone says fast, they know face, arm, speech, time to call 911. There's not an acronym or something like that for the opioid world because it's so complex. Rick, I'm sorry, you were starting to say something. Yeah, and, and just my, my, the marketing side of my brain, uh, when she said stigma reduction, I thought, oh, wow, uh, that could be a campaign. I know it's important, but from the marketing you know, side, the messaging side. Uh, well, they, actually there were three there that I heard. Well, I heard first off the prevention, second, the stigma, third, the harm reduction. Um, there could be three that organizations in this summit could come together on. Right. Um, okay. 
Chris, was there anything you wanted to add, sir? We're running short on time and I didn't want to go past any time. Well, just that I, I, I think you're right. I think if we can find the right message, the, the money will come and know that we will, you know, we will certainly do our share to match uh, three times or more whatever money we can find for this. But I, I think the message is the most important thing and the partnership and the earned media that we've talked about with the stations is something that I know they'll embrace just from conversations we've already had. So okay. um, I encourage you to just keep it going. Well, Megan, Katie, thank you. Rick, Chris, thank you. Um, we will move forward. This summit is a beginning. The summit was a beginning to get a reset on where is the state of Tennessee uh, after COVID. Uh, and I do think it is more after COVID than during. So we will look at this time, take these notes. We're having a meeting next week, like you're having focus groups, Megan. We're going to have some meetings and then reach out to some of the organizations that said we want to be part of this. Uh, we will look at that. We'll take the information. Uh, I see that there's an Amy Morawski. Amy, this has been recorded. So if you would like to watch this at a faster speed, you're more than welcome to do that. Oh, she let. No, there she is. Hey, Amy, how are you doing? I've been in and out of a lot of the sessions, sorry. Okay. <laughs> and, and Amy, who are you with? I am with the Tennessee Department of Health. We're the Opiate Response Coordination Office. Um, we work uh -huh. in, in one Tennessee for some funding activities. Correct, Noxalone and other educational pieces, I believe. Yes. Yep. The academic detailing. And well, we're just finishing up. Rick has presented a wonderful PEP program across the state of Tennessee with the Tennessee Association of Broadcasters. Messaging is a big part of that. One of those things, harm reduction, would include some of the things I believe you did up in Michigan. And so yes. this, this will be recorded, or it has been recorded, and we're going to review it and I'll make sure that Lisa gets you some information from this uh, prevention, harm reduction, and then also, uh, oh my gosh, Rick, stigma. Thank you. Stigma. <laughs> yeah, stigma. So we have a number of things that we're going to be looking at to see if there's possible messaging that we could use across the state of Tennessee to drive home those messages, not to the public, but, but to the specific audiences that we can reach. Thank and ladies you. and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us, uh, Rick. Chris, thank you from TAB for the pet program opportunity. Thank and you. Folks, good luck in the next session. I'll give you about nine minutes before the next one you go to. <laughs> Have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you very much.